Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the 2019 Elizabethtown College Peace Fellowship Lecture. Um, before we begin the, the lecture part, uh, I am not going to lecture, but I would like to uh, have a few opening remarks. Um, the Peace Fellowship uh, Lecture and the Peace Fellow is uh, sponsored by the Elizabethtown College Peace Fellowship. So the Peace Fellowship, uh, I think, is 11 years old this year. Um, it's a group of alumni and community members, so it's not just alumni of the college. I am not an alumni of the college. My wife is. So we are good examples of those who are certainly welcome into the Peace Fellowship. Uh, the college's peace identity is those very important, um, and that's uh, that legacy is uh, part of the significance in the contemporary world in which we, we live. Um, so a uh, couple of things. Uh, at the end of the, the Peace Fellowship lecture, uh, there will be a book signing out in the auditorium. Uh, please uh, give a few minutes for Dr. Hart to go from somewhere up here to back in the lobby. Um, that'll take a few minutes for that traversing to occur. Um, also, you'll find in the lobby uh, that there is an email list sign up for uh, finding out more about the Peace Fellowship and the, it, and the Peace Fellowship events. Um, I can tell you email traffic is not very heavy. So uh, do not be afraid that we will bombard you, um, but we would like to know that you're around. Um, if you're a graduating senior from the college, there are a number of students in the audience, and even if you're not, if you're going to be graduating at some point, say in the next four years, you may want to sign up um, in, in the, uh, in the uh, lobby there. If by chance I didn't bring enough sign-up sheets, just turn one over and keep on going. Um, so I'd like to uh, bring uh, David, oh, sorry, Charlie, thank you for the visual cue. Uh, Charlie Wilson um, is going to be coming up um, and to talk about uh, one of the awards that the Peace Fellowship is involved with, um, and he'll tell you more about how many there are and who they are. Um, and then, Charlie, uh, as I was about to do, you can bring Dave Kenley up. Okay. They tell me I have to be on camera. About an hour ago, um, the Peace Fellowship gave its annual award, the Eugene Clemens Award. Many of you probably know Dr. Clemens. He taught here at the school for many, many years and was a mentor to generations of uh, students on this campus. And so each year we want to honor him by giving out uh, small award to students who uh, follow in his footsteps. This year, uh, we gave an award to Jillian Nichols, class of 2022, for her work on March for Our Lives and for working with the chaplain's office to help create safe places for worship on campus. We also gave an award to Sarah Caden for her work with, uh, as an advocate for LGBTQ plus students and for women's issues. Um, so again, congratulations to those two women who won the uh, Clemens Award this year. Great to see so many people here this evening. I'm Dr. David Kenley, professor of Chinese history and director of the Center for Global Understanding and Peacemaking at Elizabethtown College. And we are very um, grateful for the service that the Peace Fellowship uh, provides. As you look around, you'll see several of our students here. Um, we are in many ways the beneficiary of their generosity and uh, I'm very happy that we've continued this um, 
collaborative relationship and look forward to doing so as into the future. Um, it's my privilege to uh, tell you a little bit about our guest speaker tonight. It's Dr. Drew Hart. He is a writer, speaker, and professor of theology at Messiah College. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm going to have to ask you to leave. <laughs> He's also a graduate of the Lutheran Theological Seminary in Philadelphia. He has um, 10 years of pastoral ministry experience, including four years at the Harrisburg Brethren in Christ Church, a racially diverse and urban Anabaptist community committed to racial reconciliation. Dr. Hart's research focuses on the intersections between racism, African-American Christianity, and the Anabaptist tradition. This might be best summed up in a phrase he uses, anablactivism. I assume he will help us unpack that word maybe a little this evening. About four years ago, he published his monograph titled, Trouble I've Seen, Changing the Way the Church Views Racism. In the preface to the book, theologian Christina Cleveland warns, quote, reader, brace yourself. Trouble I've Seen will illuminate and challenge the assumptions that you don't even know you possess. I urge you to pay close attention to, Dr. to Drew Hart's eye-opening analysis. On a more personal note, my students, colleagues, and I spent the afternoon today with Dr. Hart. He provoked each of us to reflect on our own life story and imagine an alternative world. He was disarming in such a way that all of us felt free to let down our defenses and be vulnerable. I wish I could enroll in one of his classes and participate for a whole semester. Dr. Hart and his wife Renee have three children and live in Harrisburg and we invite you next time you're on campus bring your family along we'd love to have them. For now however I want to welcome warmly welcome Dr. Hart to the podium and simultaneously urge you to pay close attention to what will certainly be an engaging and stimulating presentation. Dr. Hart. Thank you for that really kind introduction. Um, and thank you all for, Ralph in particular, for all the work that you've been doing behind the scenes to make all this happen and just for being chosen as uh, 2019 Peace Fellow for this year. It's truly an honor. Uh, as you all know, my um, talk, talk today is entitled Put on, uh, Putting on Our Blue Jeans, uh, White Supremacy, Christianity, and the Work of Racial Justice. And I want to begin by exploring, um, not a light topic, but thinking about how Christianity and white supremacy have been entangled together. And I want us to think about that um, through some early experiences I had as a student um, over at my college now, Messiah College, where I now teach. Um, and I want to uh, help us think about this intersection between Christianity and white supremacy uh, based on some chapel experiences I had that were particularly unique. When I was a student, uh, I was there from 2000 to 2004. And so I was there when 9-11 happened. I remember watching and seeing how uh, the towers being um, attacked. I remember the devastation and the confusion and the feeling of uncertainty that was in the air at that time. I also remember um, a couple of years later, a particular chapel um, that we had on campus. Just like any other chapel, I went there and in the auditorium on our campus, um, there were probably about at least 2,000 students gathered for this chapel. Uh, not necessarily thinking anything particular about this particular day, just showing up like we normally would. And there was a speaker there by the name of John Deere. I didn't know who the guy was at the time, but, um, but he was our speaker. And so we got in and we sat down and some people started doing their homework like they normally would during <laughs> chapel time. And 
I um, just sat and was curious, and, and this gentleman, he began to speak and talk about Jesus, and in particularly Jesus as found in the Sermon on the Mount. He talked about Jesus and this Jesus that called us to love our enemies, even when it was hard. He talked about this Jesus that, uh, that said, blessed are the peacemakers. He talked about this Jesus that invited us to break the cycles of violence that were so uh, deeply embedded into our lives. Um, none of that was particularly controversial, but then he continued on. He went on and he began to uh, talk about the implications for Jesus' teachings as it related to the spirit of revenge that he said that he described was a part of the ear at that time. He talked about how revenge and violence and this uh, increase in terms of militarism that was happening and how the church had just been unquestionably just kind of going along with the spirit of what was happening at that time. And he, he challenged us, right, uh, in terms of our own postures, in terms of how we were going to respond in that moment as all these things were happening. I didn't grow up in a peace church tradition, um, and so Messiah was the first time that I was in a space where that was really being pushed on a different kind of level. And so I was wrestling. I was a biblical studies major. I was wrestling with questions, trying to figure out what do I think about what's being said. And so as we, um, so as I was listening, I was trying to lean in because I grew up in a black church where they taught me to keep Jesus at the center of my life. And so I wanted to lean in because he was talking about the life and teachings of Jesus. And so I was listening curiously about what he was saying and trying to process it. And he went on, he continued to push the implications for what it meant to be followers of Jesus. And he began to get uh, very direct in his language, critiquing American nationalism, critiquing American military tourism, uh, naming George Bush, right, and the lies that he had perpetuated, right? He was just completely, and so there I am again, leaning in, deciding like, I want to hear and wrestle with what he has to say. Um, this is not light stuff, but I want to listen because I want to be a follower of Jesus, right? And so right as I begin to lean in and hear this message, I realize that there's some commotion happening in the auditorium, and so I begin to look around and I notice that there's this commotion and I, I hear foots moving and I see people getting up. And, and before I realize it, there are thousands, not thousands, hundreds of students getting up and literally leaving while he is still talking. Um, there's this mass exodus that happens while he's still speaking in response because they're really upset uh, with the message that he had to share that day. And I remember, I mean, on one hand, like, I understood why people were uncomfortable. He was going straight at what I would call sacred cows, right? Um, so I understood why people were uncomfortable, but I was a little bit curious about why, if he had such a Jesus-centered message, why couldn't they sit and wrestle with the message and how it was being applied to their lives, right? So that's, that was one of the things that I was wrestling with. So I remember at that time wondering, like, in what way was... Uh, their identities more hinged to their Americanness, right, and to their national identity more than it was to what it meant to be a follower of Jesus. And so it was one of these experiences. They're just strange moments in which you're kind of trying to wrestle with what is going on um, around you. I had a second chapel experience. There was two, I said, right? There was two chapel experiences. And the second one, I was once again uh, there at Messiah, and we had on Thursdays, well, at that time, they used to call it alternative chapels, right? So it was more choice in terms of what you wanted to participate in. And so many of the students on color um, hosted and led a chapel on Thursdays, and it was called Culture Shock, right? Culture shock, I don't know, you could interpret it different ways, right? Culture shock in terms of we're experiencing culture shock and we need a little safe space from it, or maybe the white students are going to get some culture shock when they come here, right? And there's different ways you can interpret that. So there we were, and we're culture shock, and you get diverse speakers and voices and worship expression and all of that in that um, um, student-led um, chapel. And this one particular day, there I was at culture shock, 
just like any other day. And this particular day, there's a, a black gentleman who's speaking um, as the guest. And I don't remember his name. I'm assuming now, thinking back, that he's probably about my age now, the 30-something um, year old gentleman. But, but I remember the way in which first he started with talking about the scriptural narrative of who God was and how God revealed God's self in a particular way in relationship to the Israelites. As they're in the midst of slavery, God reveals God's self as a liberator to them and takes them out of slavery, right? And he goes on, he kind of walks through the biblical story and kind of talks about how um, no matter what position uh, Israel found themselves in, God was consistently a God on behalf of those who were marginalized and oppressed and vulnerable in society, right? And so he, he argues that, that whether Israel's under Egypt or they're under Babylon or they're under Assyria, God is constantly on the side of those who are the underdogs in society, right? And, and that whether God is sending prophets against the empire or if Israel themselves begins to in, be to practice injustice, that God was consistently speaking on behalf of the oppressed, right? And then he went on and he connected it to this Jesus-centered message again, saying that the whole thing is fulfilled in Jesus, right? That, that Jesus embodies that himself. And so when Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to bring good news to the poor, release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blinds, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, right? He's embodying that essence of who God had always been as this deliverer of those who are oppressed. But he didn't just stop there with his scriptural narrative and talking about who God was. He continued then to connect it to America's history, right? And he began to talk about how there's a deep hypocrisy and gap between this, this witness of who we see God being revealed as in scripture and the legacy of slavery and oppression in this country. So he went on and talked about the 250 years of slavery, now the 100 years of Jim Crow and convict leasing systems, sharecropping and peonage and chain gangs and all the lynchings that went on during that time. And he went on to talk about in the present day how now we have you know, all kinds of unjust, unfair justice systems and inadequate housing and inadequate funding for education and all these different dynamics. And, and he, he explained how in the midst of all of that, too often, he said, the white church had been participating and advocating and perpetuating uh, the injustice, right? That, that Christianity itself was implicated in that work, right? Um, and in particular, he talked about white supremacy, he talked about whiteness, he talked about white privilege, and all these things that were manifestations of this history in the United States. So now I grew up in a black church where it, it wasn't necessarily strange to hear someone talk about race and faith, right? I had heard people talk about race and faith, but in my church growing up, it wasn't necessarily that explicit, right? He kind of was just uh, radically just getting straight to the point and unveiling things and talking uh, hard truths about our past and our history. And so once again, you know, I, I decided like, I need to lean in and really listen to what he's saying carefully. I wanna hear what he's saying. So I'm leaning in trying to hear what he has to say. And right as I start to lean in, I notice once again, there's a commotion in the room. And so I look around, and now it wasn't as many. This was primarily students of color in the chapel, but there were a few white students that were there in the chapel as well. And, and it, strangely enough, I found that many, not all, but many of the white students that came to a chapel called Culture Shock were unwilling to sit through a difficult challenge about the history of white supremacy and Christianity and the legacy of this country. And so as I was leaning in, many of them were bailing out. And once again, I began to wrestle. It was this strange moment, again, the irony of white students who chose to be at culture shock and could not necessarily then sit in in this hard message. And I was thinking, why is it that it seems that some of my peers are clinging to their whiteness more than they're clinging to their identity as followers of Jesus to listen through this hard message. And so this, those experiences helped me begin to wrestle with this strange way in which Christianity and white supremacy have been entangled with one another. I began after that doing my own history, learning about the nuances of, of church history and how you have the church 
in the East on the margins of society, um, uh, a small minority of the population that begins to grow. And by the fourth century, it becomes at least a decent but still minority population. But all of a sudden, they've got an emperor in place, Constantine, right? And you see that through that history, over centuries, up through about 1,000 AD, right, that you have this ongoing growth of the church in which Christianity is getting further and further embedded in the life of this, of the empire, right? Um, and what you eventually see is, is basically an expression of Christian supremacy being expressed over society, right? Christian supremacy being expressed over society. Many people call that Christendom, right? And often feel like Constantine himself at least symbolizes, he doesn't cause all that by himself, but he certainly symbolizes uh, this merger between uh, the church and the state getting in bed with one another, and so that there's a coercive Christianity um, that's being embodied where before that it was a Christianity on the margins working on the grassroots bottom up. What begins to happen over time in that context is that while Christianity begins in the East and is a majority of the population in the East for a very long time, eventually the West begins to have the larger Christian population. And with that shift over time, there's beginning to, there's a forgetfulness about the origins of Christianity, right? And so Christianity and Western civilization eventually get conflated with one another, right? People begin to think of Christianity as indigenous to the West, right? They begin to think of Christianity as, as, if, as if the West has a copyright on Jesus, a copyright on Christianity, a copyright on the Bible. They're the, uh, the, it's indigenous to that space, right? And they are the rightful protectors of Christianity and the interpreters of Christianity. And if anybody wants to become Christian, you come through us. In some ways, as Willie James Jennings talks about in his book, The Christian Imagination, the West forgets its Gentile identity. When this new Christianized, supposedly, West encounters the world, we see another mangling of Christianity. Europe begins to go to Africa and Latin America, right, and all around the world. And you begin to see not just a Christian supremacy over society, but a white supremacy over society. There's a morphing that takes place. In the United States, to think about this, how, this, how colonialism begins to take form all around the world, in the United States we see that the skeleton identity that births whiteness is Protestant Anglo-Saxon identity, right? That that's literally the birthplace upon which then later whiteness will expand broader and broader and broader to make room for more and more people. Um, and sometimes we miss how flexible the uh, white identity is, right? That it's not a fixed category. We think of it as some kind of fixed biological category. It's actually ideological and political work in terms of who is allowed in that category. And I'll give an example. Uh, I'll quote my good friend Benjamin Franklin um, in 1775 as he likes to define who is properly white and who is not. This is his words, quote, which leads me to add one remark, that the number of purely white people in the world is proportionately very small. All Africa is black or tawny, Asia chiefly tawny, America exclusive of the newcomers wholly so, and in Europe the Spaniards, Italians, French, Russians, and Swedes are generally of what we call a swarthy complexion, as are the Germans also. The Saxons only accepted, who with the English make the principal body of white people on the face of the earth. I wish their numbers were increased, unquote. And so we begin to see that the definition of whiteness was narrow based on Anglo-Saxon Protestant identity. But of course, as we know, over time, that 
the umbrella for whiteness was expanded, right? So that those who are German and Irish and Italian could eventually be seen as fully white, right? Before they were white with a hashtag, right? Or, I mean, an asterisk next to their name, uh, but not fully properly white. Um, but, of course, that would require that they make some moves themselves, that they need to properly become white, that it wasn't just an identity, that there has to be a choice of assimilation into this, right? There's a particular way of being in the world that's expected. And so uh, Europeans must fully anglicize themselves in the United States to become properly white, speak the right language, live in the right customs and practices. Um, and so someone like Friedrich Trump could become Fred Trump, right? Um, it's this choice. It's a choice, right? It's something to chase after, to pursue, to achieve whiteness. It's both ways. An umbrella says you are welcome in, but you must assimilate into this new way of being. Um, cut off ties from the particularity of your own communities and religions so that you can assimilate into this new white citizenship. If we think about the history of white supremacy and colonialism in society and think about its implications in terms of colonial mission, then we really get a good picture of what was really happening at that moment, right? These early missional in mission encounters that are happening all around the world. Um, so you think about it, the missionaries might go to, let's say, Africa and say, we're going to share Jesus. We want you to be made after the image of Jesus, the Son of God, right? All you've got to do is cut your hair, change your clothes, anglicize your name, cut yourself off from all your customs and practices, and voila, all things die, all things become new, right? But whose image whose image are they being fashioned after is the question, right? Uh, not Jesus. The image is, is Western man, right? Um, that is the ideal upon which they are supposed to chase after. And so we begin to see the implications, the wide implications for how white supremacy and colonial, uh, white supremacy and Christianity are mangled together within history, right? And, and it forces us to then recognize that Sometimes we treat racism solely as a sociological problem when we need to wrestle with the mutated theological realities that have, have been embedded within Christianity itself. And so racism, yes, is a sociological problem, but it's also a theological problem, that there's a, a mutated and diseased theological imagination that we have to grapple with. When we begin to see and think about our own society then, we begin to also need to recognize uh, the systemic character of racism that shapes our everyday lives. I often say, you know, uh, if you've been in many churches, um, that at least the few that actually want to talk about race, right, too often we've got the most simplistic answers to complex problems, right? So we're like, oh no, we've got 400 years of white supremacy and we've got mass incarceration and inadequate housing for folks and, and all and on and on we could go. And so let's do a pulpit swap, <laughs> all right? Let's join our worship services together once every, you know, five months, right? Now, don't get me wrong. Those things are nice. I'm not saying don't do those things, but I'm saying those are simplistic answers if we're trying to solve these larger, complex historical problems, the legacy of racism that shape our lives. Um, occasionally, because of the uh, anti-racism work that I've done, um, periodically, I've had pastors want to reach out to me and connect and get to know me and stuff. I've, especially in Philly, it happened quite a bit. It's happening more and more as people get to know me here in, in Central PA as well. Um, and one time when I was in Harrisburg, um, there was a pastor, young white pastor, who also went to my seminary while I was still finishing up um, in my MDiv program years ago. Um, and he reached out and said, yeah, can we get together and just chat and connect some? And so I said, yeah, absolutely. So there we are. We meet um, on a, the middle of the afternoon uh, on a hot summer's day. We decide to meet at a McDonald's, right? That's just, it was a central place that we could find. We met at some McDonald's and we both just grabbed some sweet teas, right? And we're just trying to cool off. And I always joke that I just, 
it's bad for you, don't follow my advice, but I love sweet tea, southern style sweet tea with all the sugar, right? It's just so good with all the sugar and you're drinking it and you're getting cavities while you're drinking. And that's exactly what you want, right? It's just good, it's good. You stick the straw in and it just sticks straight up, it doesn't move because that's, you know, um, your, your dentist, right, is freaking out. He knows for miles away that you've done something terribly wrong. That's when you know you have southern style tea. Um, and so that's what we're doing. We're just drinking sweet teas and swapping stories back and forth and kind of getting to know each other, learning about each other's backgrounds and history some. And so we're doing that and really, you know, we got to find out that we have some similarities and some differences and we agreed on things and disagreed on things. It was just a good conversation, right? Just getting to know somebody on that level. Uh, and then partway through, as we're talking, my friend, this, my pastor friend, he's at white suburban context, pastor he grabs one of these cups right and he places it in between us and he kind of gets kind of serious and he looks at me and he says drew you see i can't see what's on your side of the cup and you can't see what's on my side of the cup i need your eyes so that i can see what's on your side of the cup and and you need my eyes so that you can see what's on my side of the cup right so i was like oh we're gonna have a little sunday school special moment here this is really sweet I was like, okay, okay, this is nice. And so I'm listening, and, and after he finishes, I was like, you know, that's really nice, but the problem is, I already know what's on your side of the cup, right? And of course, he's like, yo, I'm sure, I don't know, he didn't say that, but, but I imagine he's got to think, like, Drew is pretty rude, right? I'm thinking. So I go on, I explain what I mean. I'm like, look, even from a young age, when I lived in a primarily black neighborhood, I still had primarily white teachers, I still was learning primarily about white European history and literature, right? Uh, when I went off to college, I was the only African American on my floor my first year, right? So I had to navigate that space, different music and customs and expectations, all that kind of stuff was happening. Um, PhD, all the way through my PhD, primarily white professors and stuff like that. Even when you think about like what I do today, like right now and all the time, constantly before white audiences uh, who, who I've got to figure out what are they thinking about my black body, right? Um, and so I've constantly have had to navigate white spaces at different points in my life to have an idea of white dominant culture and how to move in those spaces, uh, intellectual thought, history, all of that stuff. That's just been a part of my life. And so what I said to him, I said, but the problem is, is that you can never step foot in a black community and it won't impact you one bit. You can know nothing about black intellectual thinkers and thoughts, nothing about black history, culture, music, none of that. And it won't impact your life one bit. In fact, he was an IVP, academic press author and all that kind of stuff. But, but he didn't have to have any kind of commitment to the black community to be invested in any, for him to thrive and flourish in the work that he's doing. He won't be punished for that gap in knowledge and experience. And so then I began to explain, look, like there are systems and in institutions in place that advantage some of us and disadvantage others. It's not an equal playing foot. Uh, we're not on an equal playing uh, field when we're talking about what's going on in our society today. And so we've got to be honest about the power dynamics and the institutional differences and the ways that some institutions were created with you in mind and not me in mind, right? And so I wanted him to see that beyond uh, these moments, which are nice, it's good to have good conversation across the racial divide, right? but that we've got to begin to see that there's so much more when you think about it on a systemic level of what's happening with it, when, you, when you think about race and racism in society. We've got to think about the hierarchical realities that exist, the systems and structures and institutions and policies in place that impact our everyday lives. We can't have simplistic answers to complex problems. I often think about uh, racism and I recognize that when I try to have conversations with people around racism, too often we're like just missing each other because we don't even often have the same definition 
for what we mean when we say the word racism, right? We're talking past one another often because we don't necessarily understand what we mean. I often find that there's two prevalent main definitions that are very common in our society. Um, one uh, is that you know many people think about racism in terms of personal prejudice or hatred from one person to another across races, right? That's the I'd say the most common and prevalent way that most people think about race and racism in our society today. Um, and so they would say, look, hey, if you look up in the dictionary, that's going to be the first definition you'll see, right? Race and racism. I often tell them, yeah, and if, thanks to millennials like me, Google is also, right, in the dictionary, and selfie is in the dictionary, and that the dictionary sometimes is a reflection of how we use words, not necessarily the best use of words, right? Um, and so, but it is a common way that is probably the most prevalent way that people talk and think about race and racism today. But what is interesting is if you were to go into like a sociology department, right, or talk to like folks who study like critical race theory, oftentimes they're not going to just give you that thin definition of race and racism. They're going to have a much thicker way of describing and talking about racism in our society today, right? And so they're looking at systems and structures and patterns. They're looking at how you can actually trace and think about how race develops over history. Like, how did Europeans become white, right? That's something we don't often think about too often, right? How did Europeans, if you talk to white folks or Europeans in the 14th century and say, let's get all the white people together, they would have no idea what you were talking about, right? But eventually, over time, this idea was coined, right? Was invented, was designed to do work. Why? Why was whiteness developed, right? And what work does it cause? How, does it, how has it morphed over time, right? These are the different kind of questions that people are looking at. They're looking at the racial hierarchy. They're looking at systems and structures, policies, um, the way that race organizes our lives and the political work that it accomplishes in our world today. And so you have what I would call a thin definition of race and racism and a thick definition of race and racism. The thin definition often seems to not really accomplish much because then people are just fighting over whether somebody else has prejudice in their heart, which none of us know, right? Nobody knows somebody else's heart other than them and God. But we can see patterns and structures and the way that the impact that it has on our society as a whole, that's actually measurable and quantifiable and it can be tracked through history in terms of uh, what's been happening in our society. And so there's a different way in which we can come at it. And so for me, like, I clearly believe that the thick definition helps explain what's happening in our world today in a way that the thin definition doesn't. But regardless, if we're going to have conversations with one another, we need to make sure that we are communicating. So whether you switch your definition or they switch or whatever, we need to make sure that we mean the same thing, that we're talking about the same thing when we're communicating with one another. In the 1940s, um, there was something called the Clark Doll Experiment. Is anybody familiar with that? The Clark Doll? Yes, a few folks are familiar with that. Um, and so they had um, experiments, and they were really important, especially during the Civil Rights Movement, as they were um, pushing for um, uh, the desegregation of schools, the Clark Doll experiments were used uh, to help justify the need to integrate the schools, right? But, but what it was, it was in the 1940s itself, the experiments, they would take one child at a time, black or white, they take one at a time, and they put two dolls in front of them, a white doll and a black doll, and they ask them a series of questions, right? Which doll is the good doll? Which doll is the bad doll? Which doll is the pretty doll? Which doll is the ugly doll? All right, these are the kind of questions that they would ask these children one at a time. And it's interesting because in some ways, nobody, even still today, necessarily is like probably that shocked by the white children's response in the 1940s at that time. We, we have an idea of the kind of things that were going on in the 1940s within white society. And so we're probably not as shocked by the ideas that were being expressed. So overwhelmingly, white children saw, um, you know, the white doll is positive in all categories and the black doll is negative, right? In some ways, people talk about the Clark doll experiments not because of the white children's response. That didn't throw away. We kind of expected racist ideas to be prevalent in society in the 1940s at that time. Um, 
But what was more shocking, I think, for folks, and the reason why people still talk about those experiments today was how the black children were impacted and what they were kind of communicating at that time. Now, of course, in our society, it's very popular for people to talk about reverse racism, right? That's a big idea that people want to throw around. What's this reverse racism? We're flipping things on its head, and now white people are going to be attacked. What was interesting in the 1940s was that what they saw was that they'd ask these children the same questions, which doll is the good doll? And very often, many of them were saying and pointing to the white doll. Which doll is the bad doll? And many of them are pointing to the black doll. Which doll is the pretty doll? Many of them point to the white doll. Which doll is the ugly doll? And many of them point to the black doll. And they'd also ask them another question, which doll looks most like you? And then after giving negative attributes to the black doll, they'd point to the black doll. And what, what that shows is, well, a couple things. One is that all the children were internalizing ideas of racial hierarchy that were prevalent in society, right? They're all human beings and they were all susceptible to internalizing these really dangerous, uh, damaging ideas of race and how they see one another. Um, but also that these black children, they weren't reversing racism, right? That they were actually also, um, just, just as likely to, to both see others in their own community in a negative way and also themselves in a negative way because of the pervasiveness of how prevalent racism was in the United States, right? And so I think um, it changes the conversation a little bit when we begin to wrestle with what are the actual implications for how people respond and react to racism. Now, of course, it'd be easy to be like, well, that was the 1940s. You know, I mean, this 21st century, good thing we're done with that problem. That's behind us, right? Well, this study has been reduplicated with even more nuance, often with shades and for, so that Latinos and others can be better reflected in the studies. And they're still seeing overall um, just ongoing patterns of, of anti-blackness and racial hierarchy embedded into people's psyches in terms of how they see one another. These are still patterns that are alive and well in our society today. If we are going to begin to wrestle with um, these things, then we've got to recognize and wrestle with the ways that we are embedded and participants in society as well. We're not, none of us are outside of it. I remember I learned this lesson in a particularly striking way uh, back when, uh, if you remember when Paula Dean was on the news, she, she had her, her, the opposite, I don't know if it's not 15 minutes of fame, 15 minutes of shame, right, um, because of all her racist comments that she had, right, she, all kinds of crazy stuff. She wanted to have a plantation wedding, she was using the N-word, all this stuff came out and it was just a mess. And I just remember at that moment just how everybody responded. Everybody, like, it was like one of the few times where, like, Americans were united, right? And everyone was like, bad Paula Dean, shame on you. This is terrible. How could you think and say these horrible things? This is, it was an embarrassment, right? And everybody with one accord could agree and say, shame on you, Paula Dean. Bad, bad, bad. Shame, shame, shame. And so, you know, of course, me in the moment, I'm like, yeah, shame, shame, shame. Bad Paula Dean. How could you do that? So disgusting, right? And then all of a sudden, something just didn't seem right about this moment. I was like, wait, something's not quite right. What is going on? I got to put my finger on it. And then I realized what it was. I was like, wait a minute. How can everybody be shaming Paula Dean? Something just doesn't make sense. How can we all just be scapegoating Paula Dean for racism? Something, I mean, don't get me wrong, what she said was despicable. I'm not, I'm not here to defend what she said. I'm just, I'm talking about our response to her. How could we so easily condemn and shame and scapegoat Paula Dean? So I thought about, I was like, wait a minute, now let me think. Did Paula Dean, you know, invent racism? Right? Did she come up? Did she like have like some maybe like an evil scientist with like a vial and pour it into our water and infect us with it? And now, ha ha ha, I got you all. No, Paula Dean did not invent racism on her own, right? Paula Dean was not the inventor of it. She's a byproduct of it, right? In fact, if you really want to understand how someone like Paula Dean thinks the way she does, all you have to do is read an American history book, right? then it makes a lot of sense. You know exactly where that idea came from. And it wasn't her by herself. 
it was a society and it was communities that formed her and socialized her to see and think and act in that particular way, right? And so if we are going to be honest as an American society, all of us as participants in society have to take ownership for our own ways of participating in society. Are we actively pursuing anti-racism? Are we passive? Are we perpetuating it? What is our own role in society? And in some ways, none of us have our hands completely clean if we're all participants in this racist history. Nobody can distance themselves completely from um, the systems of uh, racialized society that we live in today. In particular, it's very challenging, I think, um, to, for white people to wrestle with their whiteness, right? Um, that's a particularly hard and challenging thing for white people to wrestle with whiteness. I imagine that every time I say white and whiteness, somebody cringes, right? White, 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 white supremacy, white privilege, whiteness, white, 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 right? I'm cringing, I'm sure. Um, but, but you got to learn to wrestle and think. Like, we got to think about what does it mean to be white? What does it mean to be white? Um, and I know, like, my experience has been that most white people don't think of themselves as white. And that's part of the challenge, right? How are you going to tell me to think about my whiteness? I don't think of myself as white. I'm just George, or I'm just so-and-so, and I'm just American. I'm a Christian, but I, I don't think and identify as white. That's not how I think and move in the world and associate myself, right? Um, I remember, I don't know if many, um, when you go to, like, the grocery store, a lot of them still have it, right? You go to the grocery store, and you have... This one aisle, right? It's a magical thing. It's called the ethnic aisle, right? You ever seen the ethnic aisle? It's a, it's a really fascinating thing, right? So, so you have this one aisle, and supposedly in this one space, something magical is happening. All the ethnicity and culture is just stuck there in this one aisle and nowhere else, right? Right? It's a, it's a fascinating way of imagining, you know, so in that framing, right, there's nothing particularly ethnic or cultural about, like, Pop-Tarts or toaster strudels or Hot Pockets, right? Um, no, of course, everything is cultural. Everything is, has ethnicity, has particularity to it, right? Um, but the problem is, is that if you're part of the majority, if you're part of the dominant culture, it's hard to see that. It's like fish in water, right? And so you might not necessarily be thinking. You, you, you imagine your own way of being as the norm, as just regular, as the universal way of doing things, right? And so when you're a universal person, when you're just normal, then everything else around you is special and different and interesting. I remember students at Messiah when I was a student, I wish I had a culture. I'm like, what? <laughs> Trust me, you have a culture, right? I can see it, right? But, but they couldn't see their own culture. They thought they were plain, boring, right? Um, but but it, in some ways, without knowing it, that's a power move without even knowing it. It's universalizing and norming oneself and then saying everybody else around me is different. That's where all the difference is happening all around me. Um, so there's got to be ways in which um, white people begin to recognize, again, this history of how Europeans became white, and then how, what was, what was the rationale for becoming white, and why did white people assimilate into that, right? What were the systemic uh, advantages that were being provided that people would want to assimilate themselves into whiteness? Um, and clearly then, again, at the same time, what were the experiences of not being white, of being excluded from that definition um, so that there's advantages and disadvantages simultaneously. It's like I often say, people talk about, you know, oh, the poor underprivileged in Harrisburg. I'm like, the underprivileged? What is that? So if there's underprivileged, then where's the overprivileged, right? Like, we're, that's the, the opposite of that. Look, how do we begin to talk about systems of advantage and disadvantage in both ways? Um, things don't just happen. Things happen through history, and we need to grapple with how that history has unfolded in our society. I remember, so when I was uh, first a youth pastor in Harrisburg, right immediately after I graduated from um, college, I was there from 05 to 08, and um, lived on Chestnut Street on the hill, and... 
I remember one day I was kind of late for a meeting, and so I hopped into my little hoopty at that time. I had a little 92 Mercury Sable. It was my first car. Um, and I was driving um, down, if you know, if you're familiar with uh, Market Street in Harrisburg. I'm driving through Market, heading kind of, you know, towards like St. Francis, if people know Harrisburg. I'm in that direction on Market Street. And if you know that neighborhood, it's a primarily black and Latino neighborhood. There are some white people there, but not a lot of white people around, right? Not a lot of white people around at all. And so um, this particular day I'm driving, and I notice that there's a lot of white people on the side. And I'm thinking, like, what in the world is going on? Why are there so many white people on the hill today? Um, and I'm driving, and I notice, like, everyone has, like, yellow T-shirts, right? So, like, they want to be seen, and they're accomplishing that, right? They're being seen. They have their yellow T-shirts. So I'm going, and I'm like, all right, this is interesting. Maybe it's a youth group or something. I don't know what's happening. Maybe they're doing a service day. So I get closer, like, around, I think, like, 15th or something. And, and I notice that there's, like, this pickup truck, right? Um, and there's, like, grocery bags, and people are, like, handing out groceries to people um, as they're just kind of walking around. I'm like, oh, all right, they're just willy-nilly just handing out to anybody. Didn't seem very strategic, but, you know, I figured, again, eh, church folk, we don't know what we're doing, right? And so we're just kind of giving out stuff. I would have stopped for a bag for myself, right? <laughs> but I was a little late, you know. It was like, Oprah, you get a bag, you get a bag, everybody gets a bag, right? And so, so whatever, I'm, it's still kind of silly. I'm just like, oh, whatever. But then I get a little closer, and then I see what was on the shirt, and it says, Harrisburg Invasion. Then it wasn't as funny anymore. Harrisburg Invasion. Like, literally, the way they construed their project was that they were invading our neighborhood. An invasion. Now, don't get me wrong, like, I'm very aware that there's such a thing as a white superiority, superiority complex, right? I'm, a, I'm aware of that, but usually it's not like the motto of the event. Um, so, I mean, I, I joke about it now, but I remember I was actually angry when I saw that. I was angry. I'm like, who dare, who do you think you are? Come into our neighborhood, like, we need your saving, and we just need to be invaded from the outside, right? And I, I stepped back, I was like, all right, maybe I'm being too harsh. Like, Drew, maybe you're just being harsh. Here's, here's people that are probably good-intentioned folks, right? Good intention, wanting to help. Why are you being, like, Drew, just relax, right? So I thought about it. I was like, all right, let me think about this. Like, all right, this is not 1850. They're not coming in. They're not enslaving anybody, right? It's not 1950, not setting up Jim Crow, right? So then what's, what's really at stake here? Then I thought about it. I said, all right, they're trying to do good, but the problem is, is that through all of that, racial hierarchy has not been demolished, right? Racial hierarchy still exists even as they're trying to do good. There's still everything to give and nothing to receive, invading, right, this kind of disparate way of, paternalistic way of engaging another community. And I thought, I was like, you know, the problem isn't that they wanted to come and that certainly there are challenges in Harrisburg. I'm not going to pretend like we don't have challenges in Harrisburg, right? But there, there already were lots of people doing good work in the community. It's not absent of community. And I imagine, like, what could have happened if they had reimagined and saw, look, are there ways that we can partner and come underneath the pre-existing leadership that's there already, right? Maybe they said, look, we don't need your groceries, but you could do, you know, maybe you mentor this or do that or X, Y, Z, whatever. But there could have been a possibility where if they had broken the, the hierarchy, right, that, that they could have reimagined their relationship with folks in the community and not seen themselves as the teachers, but maybe even as the students, that there's something to learn to be received from those even as you are trying to serve others, Right. Um, where the first are last and the last are first. You know, when we begin to realize these huge systemic realities that exist in our society, we can talk about mass incarceration, housing, education, health care, jobs, wages, all kinds of stuff. We could go on and on and on about all the different systemic challenges that our society faces and how race in particular 
uh, impacts all of those different realities as well for people in their everyday lives. Um, we begin again to wrestle with the complex systemic injustice that exists, and we think about the ways that we need to uh, confront and challenge and change these systems and structures. You know, in Harrisburg, I've collaborated, I mean, I'm a part of a small little group uh, called Free Together, and we try to uh, partner with different organizers and activists in the city. Uh, we've partnered with a whole range of different folks at different points, right? There's a group called Power Interfaith to do organizing. We've done some stuff with them. We've done MILPA. They work with undocumented folks in our community. We work with them. We've done, in fact, along with that, shut down Berks County Detention Center movement, right? And we've done some stuff with them, some vigils and stuff. We've um, even a little bit, I've done just a little bit with the Poor People's Campaign when they're in Pennsylvania. I've done a little bit, not a lot with them. Um, but there's these different movements and things that are happening around us, and, and they're challenging and recognizing the systemic problems that exist. And there's good work already happening all around us, right? Uh, there's good work already happening, um, and we need to be figuring out ways in which, particularly faith communities, can be participating in good work that's happening all around us. I'm a big uh, fan of uh, Vincent Harding, who was a friend of Dr. King, and he wrote the book, There is a River, right? And There is a River is, is this analogy that he gives to provide to talk about um, this ongoing struggle and resistance that Africans were engaging in from the moment that they were grabbed in Africa all the way up through emancipation, right? He tells this ongoing story that all the different varied ways that resistance and struggle was happening. He says struggle was inevitable, right? And he talks about it, this flowing river that exists. Sometimes it's flowing hard, sometimes it's slow, um, but it's always present. There's always this, the, the human spirit, the human will to struggle for freedom that exists and that we can be participants, right, in those movements, in this move that's happening in society all around us. Um, but we've got to make a choice about whether we're going to be passive or active in response to these movements that are happening. We can join in and participate in what's happening. Um, I was, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I'll just say, you know, there are a lot, especially for faith communities, there's multiple options that I think are conducive for faith communities to get involved in, right? I'm not going to spend all the time that I had on my thing, but I'll say this, you know, just nonviolence struggle in general is something that we need to be taking serious and learning more about. Uh, Faith-based organizing is something that we need to be um, taking serious. It's very conducive work for churches. Uh, radical protest movements, when, especially when, when you have these kairos moments where change is in the air, unrest is in the air, um, sometimes we can really participate and take advantage of the whirlwind, that, the energy that is ready for, for, for change. Um, and yeah, there's just so many different ways um, beyond that that we can um, get involved in change. Um, and I think there's a story I want to end with, and it really... Um, uh, hopefully can encourage us to kind of get to work, right? Again, these complex systems and structures, how do we begin to get to work? Um, it's a story uh, about Dr. King that is rarely told, um, but I think it's a really powerful story. Dr. King in 1963 is in Birmingham. A lot of people know the, about the Birmingham movements, the their Project C, it's a uh, confrontation, right? That's what they're trying to do. At this point in King's career, he's starting to really experiment more with different approaches than what he had done in the past. And a lot of it was shaped by what he saw the students doing in the 1960s sit-in movements, that they were putting their bodies on the line. So he's creatively trying to structure along with his uh, folks around him to create the conditions upon which they can expose the crisis, right, that's happening there in Birmingham, because Birmingham was AKA known as Bombingham, right? Because all the unsolved bombings and the terrorism that black people were living with every day. And so they weren't unfortunately getting the kind of responses that they had wished they um, were gonna get from folks. And so they find themselves as Passover and Good Friday is approaching, they find themselves in this crisis moment because one, their funds are depleted or getting depleted basically. And if they don't have funds, you can't bail people out, and nobody wants to go to Birmingham jail without any funds. That's a scary predicament, right? 
And on top of it, then most of the folks there are ministers. And so uh, you can think about black church pastors. I mean, they got responsibilities in their churches this coming weekend all over the place. Um, you know, Easter weekend is not a small affair in the black church. And so they need to be, you know, present for their communities. And so they got that. Some people are wrestling with, like, what do we do? Do we send King out to go do some fundraising? Right? So there they are in the hotel room. Um, all sitting around and all debating what should they do. Some people, King's got to go out, right? Some people, um, no, we got to be in our churches. That's what, where we belong. We have a responsibility to our communities, right? Um, all these different debates about what should be done are happening. And the whole time that people are debating, King is just sitting there quietly. He's not saying anything at all. Not a word. He's just listening. So they're debating, they're going on about what's happening, and suddenly Dr. King gets up and he leaves the room and goes into the bedroom. They're in like the kind of outer living room space. He leaves the room and they're still debating and arguing about what they should do. Finally, minutes go by and suddenly the door swings open and out comes Dr. King. And if you can imagine, like normally, if you think about the pictures that you see Dr. King, normally he's in a black suit, right? And a uh, nice kind of clean, classic look, right? Well, he's now changed his clothes. He comes out with changed clothes, and now he's wearing a blue work shirt and blue jeans. And the moment he comes out, everybody knows what this means, right? We're getting to work, right? Uh, we're going out there. We're not going to get dressed up for Easter. We're going to embody this thing on the streets, right? We're not just going to practice our faith uh, in the safety of our four walls, we're going to embody the meaning of this tradition itself. I mean, literally Passover and Good Friday, right? Suffering on behalf of others, um, that they're going to embody that for others and get to work. And so he put on his blue jeans, and there's that famous shot of him and uh, Ralph Abernathy and um, Fred Shuttlesworth all wearing blue work shirt, blue jeans. That's that one moment because of that decision that he had made and the leadership to say, look, we've got to get to work, right? And I believe that, you know, again, we're 400 years in of white supremacy in this land, of anti-black racism, of all these problems, deep, difficult, complex problems that are not just going to get a, go away with, you know, just meeting over a drink and getting to know someone who's different from us across the racial divide, right? Again, those are good things. I'm not telling you not to do those things, but I'm saying if we want to actually challenge and change the way our society organizes itself because of how race has shaped our society for so long, we've got to get to work. And so my invitation is, let's put on our blue jeans, right? Let's put on our blue jeans for justice. Let's put on our blue jeans for truth, for righteousness, for peacemaking, right? Let's put on our blue jeans and confront systems of mass incarceration. Let's put on our blue jeans so that people can have livable wages and health care. Let's put on our blue jeans so that, so that folks can have adequate funding for education in their communities, right? Let's put on our blue jeans and let's get to work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Hart. I uh, should have asked him beforehand, but I just grabbed him right now and said, can we ask you some yeah, questions? Absolutely. He said yes. So uh, John and myself have a couple microphones. We don't have a lot of time, but if you'd like to ask a question, go ahead and raise your hands and we'll bring the mic to you. Do you want me to stand up? Is that important? Okay. <laughs> Hello, you want me to tell my name too? Is that uh, part? My, my, my name is Ricky Bug and I live in, in the community. Uh, I live in Palmyra with my wife, Paula. Uh, very well done, thank you very much. Question, have you seen or are you working with groups where you've seen this be successful, meaning putting on the jeans and getting, getting to work? Yeah, I mean, I think there are, there, I mean, the great thing is that there are communities, right, all around the country where people are getting to work. And in fact, I mean, it's, 
I know like right now can be somewhat depressing time for some, right? You see all the national news and all the chaos that's going on. And so things look very bleak on one hand, but like what I've actually gotten to see also at the exact same time simultaneously is that there are also our communities who are awakening and who are igniting and mobilizing for justice, right? And so, yes, um, and I, I mean, some of what I just mentioned in terms of some of the stuff that I mentioned in terms of free together in terms of power interfaith, in terms of MILPA, um, poor people's camp. I mean, there are lots of faith communities involved in those movements um, who are getting, getting to work, right? Um, there's no question that there's some ebbs and flows, and so the commitment level, we've got to see, we, we, it needs to be persevering commitment level, right? So, like, I remember when MILPA, uh, after there was the Trump, um, after the first word came out around families being detained, children being detained, and Milpa held a, an event in Harrisburg, and it was like people, thousands and thousands, I mean, there were people around the block and stuff, and then, you know, over the summer, they had another event, it was like 30 of us, right? And I was like, where did everybody go, right? Because it wasn't, you know, at the moment, the kind of, and so I do think, you know, the question is, um, do we have the long haul commitment to stay persevering in this work? I think that that matters. Um, how do we encourage people ongoing work? I think that, and that I think faith communities are able to do if, if we would kind of work together, collaborate and inspire one another to, in that work. Um, but it is happening. Um, and so, you know, we just got to go look and be encouraged by what's happening on the ground, I think. But yeah, that's a great question. I'm not, I'll try to answer. I'm not sure if I completely understand the exact question, but I think I have an idea of where you're getting at. Yeah, I mean, I think the trick thing is, I don't know if you can separate culture, I mean, faith, if, if, I mean, I guess it depends on what you mean by faith, but faith, as in, in terms of Christian faith, and most people's faith is embodied and lived, right? So it always has cultural practice and um, ways of expressing itself that are cultural. Um, so we, it's hard to separate faith and culture. And also, ethnicity by definition is about a community that has shared practices and ways of being that, that give them a sense of ide identity. Um, so again, I don't know if those are clean ways of differentiating, but I do think when you're talking about like, what, I mean, one of the challenges is 
the language of privilege itself, I mean, it's a word, I actually don't, it's, I, I did use it just to tease you guys when I said white, 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 white privilege, white supremacy, right? But I actually don't use the word white privilege too often um, because I do feel like it's a word that is so mushy in terms of how it's understood. Um, and so it's not because, I mean, as you can tell, it's not because I'm avoiding having hard conversations. I actually want to be more clear about what we're talking about. And I think that the language of white privilege is so muddled right now. People use it in economic terms. Sometimes people use it in systemic terms. People use it in a whole variety of ways. Some people hear it as, I'm doing well in life, right? And I'm like, well, my people are struggling, so I don't have any white privilege, right? So it's a very confused term right now. And so that, along with the defensiveness that I often see, that's usually a term that I tend to stay away from because I feel like there's actually more words that are actually bring more clarity to the subject, right? So how do we talk about systems of advantage, right? Um, not placing privilege within the body, but within society and systems and structures and policies and habits, right, within the broader society, and then ask ourselves, how do we navigate those spaces? What is our responsibility, whether black, white, Latino, Asian, whatever, however we inhabit this world, how do we engage? And I think that that asks us a different kind of question, because then we're responsible to systems of injustice, and how do we respond, whether it's advantaging us or disadvantaging us, right? Um, but when we make it a passive thing um, in terms of individuals and say, you have white privilege, right? I don't know. I always say, like, if I was white and someone just randomly told me I had white privilege, even if I agreed with them, I wouldn't know what to do. It would just be like this passive thing that I just have, right? I don't know what to do. I don't know how to live in response to it. And so I've sat in circles where white people are all, you know, everyone's crying because they have white privilege and they're feeling bad. And they think the work is just feeling bad about themselves because they have white privilege, right? And there's, I'm like, that can't be the work. Please, let's not let that, please let that not be the work, right? We've got to find a way where we can link arms together and dismantle systems and structures, right? And we can be honest about the ways that it advantages or disadvantages us in those particular systems and policies and practices that exist. So um, I don't know if that's getting at your question at all. Let's let uh, Dr. Hart respond to that really quickly, if he chooses to, and then we're going to get one more question from the floor. Yeah, so I would just say, number one, I don't think we can separate whiteness from America and the American project, right? Those two ideas are deeply, deeply bound in terms of the history of, I mean, even when we think about American exceptionalism, right? That language of just the benefits of America, America exists as it does completely out of the history of uh, uh, the erasure and the genocide of indigenous people and the enslavement of black people. That's the economy was built on that. Everything exists. None of this would exist had the colonial project not happened. So I don't know how to separate the one from the other. I think we have to see the, what people call the blessings of this nation, right, in terms of prosperity, as all tied to the American project. Um, and furthermore, I think that when we wrestle with that then, um, and we talk about the language of blessings in particular, especially if we're talking about it from a Christian standpoint, is that Jesus himself redefines blessings, right? It's so interesting how Christians, how we talk about blessings completely opposite to how Jesus redefined them, right? And he says, blessed are the poor, blessed are the hungry, right? And he goes and farther and he says, woe to you who are rich and woe to you who are filled now. Um, that's out of Luke, right? And so Jesus redefines blessings and woes in a way that we keep our ears plugged because we as Americans don't want to hear that hard message. 
And so we keep calling financial prosperity blessing, right? And all that kind of stuff. And I think that that is a dynamic that we haven't quite yet, at least for Christians, for those who are not Christian, you don't have to read, you can define it however you want to, but for Christians, they ought to be redefining it in a Jesus-shaped way. And I feel like it then returns to thinking about this Jesus identified with the poor and the, and the oppressed, the marginalized, the vulnerable, uh, the least, the last, and lost of society in that way, right? And I think that um, that asks a different question for us. Well, I said one more question, but maybe that's a good place to end. Is there one burning question? Got, okay, this will be our last question over here, John, if yeah. you want to take him to the microphone. My name is Thomas, and I was curious as to how often in your classes the issue of restitution mm -hmm. comes up, mm -hmm. because we can, yeah. we're talking about uh, the haves and the have-nots, and when you look through the Bible, you only see parables saying, as Christians, you provide restitution, mm -hmm. and you have an obligation to do that. So I was curious as to, in your discussions yeah. about the discrepancies and what leads to racial biases, does restitution ever come up? And if it does, in what context? Yeah. Now you're going to get me in some trouble here because I literally this past Sunday just preached a message on Zacchaeus, right? So get me all warmed up. I won't, I won't go there right now. Um, it's interesting. So I teach a first year seminar class called The Politics of Blackness, and it looks at black history and intellectual thought and some theology in there as well. And so um, one of the things we actually almost just finished um, from last week is a book called The Color of Money, right? The Color of Money. And it looks at um, the wealth gap, the racial wealth gap in our society today. Um, and it looks at the history of how it happens over time, decade by decade. She just in incrementally just walks you along history, right? And so with my students, we're reading and looking at, I mean, all kinds of stuff from not only, I mean, she spends a little bit of time, not much on slavery, because that's not really where the, the real action is, is, is telling the 20th century story, right? And so she spends a little bit of time on slavery, just to make the obvious point that the country's economic system was built on the labor of, of stolen labor from black people, right? I mean, that's just obvious. But then she moves on and she looks at how, again, no restitution for black people after slavery. Um, and then some white slave masters actually given reparations, right, for their, their lost property. Um, and then early 20th century, you have the New Deal and FHA loans and um, Homestead Acts and credit loan program, all kinds of programs where government aid is going to white people, right? Um, government welfare and aid is helping to create the white middle class, right? Um, and so prior to that, you don't even have a real white middle class until that point. And so she walks and helps you see that and see how black people are intentionally excluded from participating in that, right? And she just keeps telling that story over and over again, the different ways that black people are excluded from participation in the economic system, how it's a segregated economic system that they're asked to fix, and how we want black people to do magic with black banks in a segregated, weakened economy in the midst of a prosperous system that we're being left out of, right? And how wealth has been passed on through housing because of FHA loans and all that kind of stuff in white communities, and how black communities still uh, high levels of lack of home ownership in the communities, right? All these things she packs on. So my students, they understood the argument completely. They read it. They understand that there's been intentional injustice targeted discrimination against black people on an economic level. And it, what was interesting, though, for me is that some of my white students, after reading all of that and at getting to the end of the book where she talks about there's got to be intentional remedies, right, responses. So if there was targeted racism that caused these problems, the only thing that's going to, because it keeps growing, right, the wealth gap keeps growing, the only thing that's going to fix it is targeted remedies that both 
help even the playing fields and also that integrate the economy, right, um, on a broader level than that. And what was fascinating to me was that some of my students, not all of them, immediately, the moment we started talking about restitution and reparations, their response was, well, is this going to be fair for white people? What's going to be the impact for white people? How is this going to hurt them? What, who's going to pay for it? All of that. And so it, what, what, what I realized was that literally, even knowing the history, that their, the, their empathy and identity was still racialized so deeply that they couldn't even identify and care about the impact that it, this has had on black people for centuries, right? That that's how powerful the kind of socialization and formation that they had received, that they, even knowing all this history and knowing and can say it was wrong, it's terrible, and yet their first concern before anything else is what's the impact on white people? It was, it was actually quite a dis uh, discouraging um, response for me to see and hear that. Um, and we talked through it and we worked through and had a broader conversation, but, but just the way that race um, binds our empathy, controls it, manages it, puppets it, right? Um, I, I think that that is probably the biggest challenge that we have, right? what would it mean for people to love black people in this country, right? And I have to say, it's, it's tough enough, to, not only white people, to get black people to love black people sometimes is hard work, nonetheless to get white people to love black. It's such pervasive anti-black racism that's so deeply embedded in our society, and unless we're being intentional about it, talking about it, confronting it, uh, weeding out all of that nastiness inside of us, right? Um, then we're not going to ever even get to a point where we can have a meaningful conversation about restitution and reparations in this country. At every stage, um, we've denied the, even the conversation around it, the exploration of the subject, right? And America's not always anti-reparation. There's times where we were okay, we, we believed Jews, oh, they deserve reparations in Germany, right? And even in the U.S., though, not to say it's not in a sufficient manner at all, but Japanese internment, uh, folks who were interned in, in the Japanese internment camps did receive some, not sufficient. And same thing, some Nat Native Americans, not sufficient, but the, but the idea of reparations is not an anti-American thing. We realize that there's times in which repair is necessary, right? And then we claim to be a Christian nation, which is deeply embedded in the logics of making things right, of repair, of amends, right? That's deeply embedded in the logics. And Jesus himself, again, with even Zacchaeus, teaches that. Um, but we're not even ready for that conversation yet because race is too strongly binding and controlling and dictating even our empathy and our who we identify with that we can't have that conversation yet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we'll take a few minutes. Uh, Drew will... Um, probably need a bit of a moment <laughs> and uh, he'll come out to the lobby in a few minutes um, to uh, sign some books so thank you very much for coming stay tuned uh, for information about next year's Peace Fellow and Peace Fellowship lecture and we'll have some notice out in about six months uh, feel free to sign up for, on our mailing list that's also in the lobby and have a safe trip home thank you very much <laughs>